Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our Accelerating Women in Leadership session today. My name is Michelle Anthony. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at LHH. We're the world's leading career transition and talent development company. I'm very excited to be joined today by Vince Molinaro, the founder and CEO of the Leadership Contract, Inc., as well as a prominent advisor and author. And also today, I'm joined by Kit Krugman. She is the head of organizational and cultural design for the Co-Collective, a strategic consultancy firm. So Vince and Kit, I think the first question we may want to tackle today is uh, the COVID-19 crisis and how has the pandemic changed expectations of women leaders? Kit, over to you first for your thoughts. Thank you, Michelle. I'm really pleased to be here. So, you know, I think we need to start off with the fact that the expectations of women, both in the workforce and at home, have not really meaningfully changed. Um, and I think that that has been become particularly acute during COVID, where the pressures and expectation at home are particularly pronounced because of the lack of childcare outside of the home. Um, I was recently reading the McKinsey report on women in the workforce, and it actually mentioned that nearly 2 million women are actually considering leaving the workforce. So this just shows the real gravity of the challenge that we're facing and how important it is for organizations right now to think about how do you support women, women in the organization all up, and particularly women in leadership, because we already have a challenge of not having enough women in leadership in general. Yes, very fair point. And that 2 million number is staggering and, and would be a real, a real loss. So, um, so it just highlights how important this issue really is for all organizations. Vince, um, through the clients that, that you partner with and advise, how have you seen the pandemic um, sort of surface around this area of women leaders and expectations? Well, I think building on what, what Kit said, and, and thanks for having me uh, be part of this panel, um, and be part of the conference. Uh, quite excited to have this conversation with you both. Um, but what I'm finding is pretty much what, what Kit has experienced is like any kind of crisis, uh, it amplifies uh, areas that are, are, are weak and organizations that have not paid attention to diversity, inclusion and equity. Uh, it really plays out and, 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 and the problems are manifest you know, even more. Uh, I mean, what I have seen is companies really send messages to their managers and to their leaders to, real dial, to really dial up empathy at this point in time, to be really respectful of uh, their teams, their people, uh, and their women because of exactly the conditions that they're facing in terms of the increased demands. And so that, that empathy helps, and I think that empathy is going to be critical as we come out of this. Um, because I think that's a foundational element of, of uh, being open, uh, being inclusive, is uh, you know having that sense of empathy and that sense of respect and, and dignity for others. So I'm seeing that certainly uh, play out. And then and then day to day, um, you know, I'm really seeing managers uh, do you know take a really concerted effort uh, on how they are managing their teams and really uh, paying more attention to the personal lives of their employees in ways that they probably haven't done so. Uh, pre-pandemic, and, and that I think is is a good sign. Long way to go, for sure, but uh, certainly with the clients I'm working with, I'm seeing those things as positive uh, evolutions. Super, and and I know Vince, you had indicated in a previous conversation that we had that um, that it was important to, for I think women to feel heard. That you had seen that um, surface, you know, um, in organizations. So any any and any tips. Um, or tactics you, you've seen companies successfully employ to, to, to hear that collective voice or to, to be more empathetic? Well, you know, a, a tangible recent experience with a client uh, uh, that, you know, they had a, 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 among the senior leadership team that we worked with, they had a 60-40 split, 60% men, 40% women. So on the surface, pretty good gender balance, right? Uh, so senior, senior uh, leaders. And yet, what we found um, uh, in, in, in the program is we also found that the 40% of the women were extremely strong leaders and were really impressed with how they showed up. Uh, so strength there and the company was investing in their development. But when we were facilitating a session with the leaders, what became clear uh, was that one of the day-to-day -day issues that 
the male leaders were not even aware of was is how they inadvertently kind of silenced the women. You know, that, that there was a, it was a creative organization, so a lot of creative type of individuals, passionate about their work, and the men would dominate in meetings and in conversations. And some women, while they were quite strong and confident, found that they didn't have the airspace uh, to interject. And when this finally became a dynamic that we opened up, uh, it was, a, was one of the most amazing conversations I've seen because for the men, it, they realized how much this was a blind spot for them. Uh, they realized that some of this, for most of them, wasn't done with intent. And, and for the women, they, they, some of them had to realize how they just needed to kind of step up a little more uh, to make sure their voice what was heard. And so we kind of got to a place of helping them work through how they can kind of catch themselves in future meetings to avoid that dynamic. So what I'm really appreciating, you know, about diversity, inclusion, and, and, and equity uh, is like, we don't need any more research uh, on this topic. There's enough data out there that tells us it's a problem, right? World Economic Forum says it's going to take us 170 years to get to gender parity if we keep doing what we're doing. So that's not good enough. Uh, and so we've got to pay attention to what are we doing every single day? What am I doing as a leader in my own company, my own business, and what are we doing with our teams? And I think that's coupled with what organizations are doing uh, more strategically and from a policy standpoint is what we need to do. And, uh, and so as a leadership advisor, I'm more interested in how do we you know, really help leaders acquire the mindsets and the skills to excel at this area. And, and so that one client experience was really uh, eye-opening. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. That, that's, that's amazing. Um, and, and thinking about leadership skills, I think perhaps maybe the, the next question might be, you know, we've seen in, in the media a lot lately, um, a lot of research around um, how successful some female leaders have been in leading their countries or companies through the COVID-19 crisis. Kit, I'd love to get your perspective on perhaps why is that? Yeah, Michelle, I'd be happy to happy to address that. I wanted to just say one thing just about what Vince just shared that was evoked for me. I work with a lot of women in the innovation sector and I work with a lot of companies that are trying to build innovation capacity or capabilities as well. And one of the things that I've run into in a lot of the work and in a lot of the conversations I've had with individual women is the social expectation for women um, to make others comfortable. And one of, the, one of the biggest challenges and frustrating things about that is that in when you're doing innovation work, as we all know, the key is to take risks, to do things that are a little bit outside of the comfort zone. And it, it, there's a real challenge going back Vince, to what you shared. If the social expectation is that the women in the room are making people comfortable, then it becomes a lot harder for them to share that kind of provocative thought or idea. And so I just wanted to double down on, I think, an awareness around, around the social expectation that we all carry into the work that we do around what is a woman's role in the workplace and how it can have complexity, nuance, and range that extends beyond um, some of the historical and social expectations of women. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to add that um, before we went into the next question. On the question of, of women in leadership, um, I, I've been so, you know, we've been, the, the many of the communities that I'm in of, of women who are supporting other women have been really celebrating over the past um, couple months, even, even though it's been very challenging times for women, um, the incredible examples of, of leadership um, that's being demonstrated by women like, and, you know, I think there's a, there's a couple of things that that comes down to. Um, you know, it's it's controversial also to say that it's 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 female leadership that is is unique. I think it's just great leadership, right? That's that's where we start. It's great leadership, and the fact that women in particular are demonstrating those great leadership skills is um, personally not a surprise to me. But also uh, yet another symbol, hopefully, to young women of the possibility of them holding those power positions and seeing what authority looks like when women take it up. So, you know, I think some of the the characteristics and attributes of what we've been seeing and women taking on those leadership and authority positions are um, decisiveness, right? So um, Jacinda Ardern in, um, in New Zealand, obviously incredibly decisive, locked down very early um, and very human and very empathetic, Vince, as you mentioned, in terms of really trying to, to 
be in the experience with her people very and bringing her whole authentic self um, to that. So I think that she's just incredible. Um, Angela Merkel is another example who, um, who really was doing some great leadership modeling saying, I am taking this seriously and therefore you should too. And here's why. And I think that, I think leadership modeling is one of the single most influential and important things that a leader can do in terms of asking others to behave in a certain way. And, you know, we haven't been able to see that in, in our country as, as well. Yeah, and if I can, Michelle, I'd like to build on on, on, on the points because Kit, you're, you're so right. I mean, I, I was, I was uh, in New Zealand on a business trip two weeks after the you know the tragic massacre at Christchurch and uh, being there and seeing you know how uh, you know Jacinda Ardern's leadership just resonated with um, you know folks in New Zealand uh, but but more importantly how that story resonated around the world and how she was held up as a model and you're absolutely right it's not about female leadership or male leadership as a leadership advisor I want great leadership from everybody. We need great leadership from everybody, male or female or whomever. And, and so, uh, and I, you know, my sense is what we're seeing is this combination of there is, there is fierce resolve, there is decisiveness, there is determination, and coupled with this sense of relating to what others are going through, um, that empathy, uh, that really seems to speak to people at this moment in time. And, and we're, we are seeing other examples that are completely opposite of that right now. And you can just see how it, you know, and, and so what I always look for is, you know, the visceral response from people who are being led. And her is the one example, but the other women as well, is that, that people want to follow them. Because at a time of crisis, you know, when we are, like the time we're facing now, as human beings, we naturally look to our leaders. And so that modeling that you speak to, Kit, is, is really, really critical. So it's exciting to see just great leadership um, uh, full stop. And the fact that it happens to the, a lot of women in political roles uh, uh, or political leaders uh, running their countries uh, is no coincidence. And, and it's, it's great to see that playing out. And there's lots to learn from what they're doing. And their styles are very unique from each other, right? They're very, very different. Uh, but it's just great to see how they're managing the complexity of our times so well right now. Yeah, indeed. Thanks Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think if we think about that, that empathy and that inclusivity that you both have referenced, um, how can organizations drive a more inclusive culture? I think what advice would you have to impart um, uh, I guess starting with you, Kit, on, um, on that from a culture perspective. So part of the challenge I, I really think is that um, going back to leadership modeling, leadership does a lot of design of the organization, both unconsciously and consciously, right? So consciously in making decisions about policies and processes and what matters and re what is rewarded um, and unconsciously in their behavior and um, what they recognize, who they promote. And part of the challenge is when you have leadership that is not necessarily representative of the broader community, you design for the leadership. So you design around your needs. And when I think about think creating cultures of inclusion, I think about actually designing, taking a user-centric view, right? And in this case, an employee-centric view. How do we actually design around the needs of those who are active participants in the ecosystem and, and often those we serve, right? We think about organizations that are made up um, of predominantly men, um, serving communities of women, designing products for women, right? Obviously, at the end of the day, the, those products don't necessarily, unless they've really taken into account the voice and the experience and the unique attributes of the women they're serving. The same is true with having a predominantly white organization that's serving communities of color, right? We need to think about how do we actually include the voice of those who we're ultimately designing for, ultimately impacting in order to actually design a system that works for all, not just for that top echelon. Yeah, very fair point. And, and how have you seen, have you seen that phenomenon, Vince, and the, the clients that you're working with? And, and how have you seen, you know, strong, inclusive cult cultures developed? Well, and, you know, in many, in many ways, it gets back to what Kit says, right? It's, it's what's the tone being set at the top. 
Um, you know, I think a lot of times senior executive teams don't appreciate how much, uh, you know, the, the collective tone that they, they set and how much employees infer from their behavior uh, uh, or the messages that, that they put forward. So it really is this sense of being really, really deliberate. And I think it gets back to, you know, if I'm the CEO, uh, have I spent time really thinking about this uh, myself? You know, I'm working with a client now and, and chatting with, you know, the CEO of a company in a um, kind of health products field. And for them, the trigger around diversity, inclusion, and equity was, was really, um, you know, the, the tragic death of George Floyd that put a spotlight on systemic racism. But for them, what they started to, to, to realize is as they started to really think about, um, you know, the, the, how they were treating employees uh, of any kind of diversity, uh, it, they just started to realize that, you know, even in, in, as, as she, you know, she said in the conversation is, even when they think about women in leadership, it's, it's not a homogeneous <laughs> a population that there are, there are, you know, there are needs that are diverse even within that, right? And, and so they've been going through quite a bit of work, uh, the senior team in, in training around unconscious bias, having the kinds of conversations with their employees um, and understanding from the employee perspective how they're feeling, you know, those who are feeling marginalized, those who are not feeling heard, those who are who, who really aren't feeling like I don't think you really get me, <laughs> um, and get where I'm where I'm coming from, and and you know what she's saying, you know what she said is it's 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 tremendous, uh, tremendously difficult work uh, to really peel back and kind of get at um, you know how you think, how you've been conditioned, what are some of those social expectations that Kit referenced that are there but we're not even aware of them and we operate kind of on autopilot. So I think for a lot of um, you know, senior executives who need to set the tone, I think they need to appreciate the kind of personal work they have to do to really get at this if they're going to kind of set that kind of modeling that we need uh, today. And then once they do that, then anyone in a leadership role, whether you're a middle manager or a frontline leader or a team lead, um, because of the role, you've kind of got to do that yourself because ultimately, you know, you are, you know, Every leader and manager needs to ask themselves, what am I doing from an inclusion standpoint? What am I doing from a diversity standpoint, exclusive of what our company policies are? I can still control my team. I can, I can control who I bring on my team, how I relate to my team. And, and those are the things that I think are the emerging questions and the, the dialogue uh, that I'm having with some of my clients. Yeah, no, that's great. That, that awareness, um, it, it, it reminds me of a, Training. I actually just went through inclusivity training, um, so it was great to see the the company invest in that. And um, there was a, a professor from Michigan State University that led it, and and it was all about how our brains are wired, the science of the brain, and how we are hardwired, unbeknownst to us, to have these unconscious biases. Um, so really, the big takeaway there was just mindfulness and intention. Right, um, which I think is exactly what what you were sharing, Vince. So, so thank you for that. Um, I guess to, to to continue advancing the conversation just a little bit, I know we always um, like to receive really practical, tactical um, advice sometimes as leaders. So, what advice um, would you have for leadership teams um, on how they can better support women in the workforce? Um, back over to you, Kit. Yeah, well, I think it, I actually believe it starts with exactly what Vince was sharing and and Michelle, what you're echoing, which is really recog- do, being willing to do the work, starting with yourself. Like I think, I think that you know, I, I take a systems view, and it's it's self, it's self in system, it's self in group, and all of those different dynamics. You're bringing both these unconscious biases, unconscious assumptions to the table, as well as all these kind of conscious assumptions, and so it's it's a life's work to try to understand those. I think that, um, you know, and you have to have incredible learning agility and the ability to be interested in growth um, and self-growth in order to take that lens and say, you know what, I want to really challenge myself and I want to really understand what I'm bringing to the table in these dynamics and in these relationships. So I think it absolutely starts with the self. 
That said, I think it is also really important to look at the system you've designed. And that goes from everything to the little policies. Um, you know, policies, I think policies end up feeling like something that is administrata, but at the end of the day, they end up being incredibly powerful in the lived experience of your community. And so looking for inequity in policies, I think, you know, I used the example of parental leave, which is um, there's been a lot of work done over the past years on creating more equitable parental leave. But as long as we have a system where primary caregiver leave, which is predominantly women, not always, of course, um, is much longer than secondary caregiver leave, which is unique to the US as well, right? Like that's a that's not standard across the world, then you end up having a situation where women are at a disadvantage um, when they're building a family with a partner. So I think I think things like that where you you look at the system, and by the way, there are there are companies that have equal parental leave, for instance, that that socially or culturally don't encourage that the secondary caregiver takes that leave or that secondary caregiver will be judged or chastised. So I think things like that, you really have to look at your system and say, am I really supporting women throughout the experience of being in the workforce? Am I um, providing the support, sponsorship, community, education, all of the systemic pieces of supporting um, anyone in the workforce and making sure that that is really equitable and even. Yeah, very fair. And Vince, um, other thoughts to add on uh... How to help uh, how to help leadership teams um, better support women in the workforce? Well, you know, I, I I'll I'll just sort of counterbalance uh, because uh, Kit's Kit's response provided a, a a great you know systems view, um, and and I think in many ways I, I'm going to personalize it you know because as a leadership advisor you know that, that that's what I ultimately do, and when I talk about accountability at the end of the day, it's what am I doing? What am I doing every single day? Um, you know, for example, if you, you know, you look at uh, your own team, uh, what's the gender balance on that team? Uh, to what extent are you aware of what, what people are dealing with personally so you can uh, better support them to manage home, manage work, you know, where, where necessary? Uh, how do you create a team environment where everyone feels like they've got uh, a voice and, and don't feel like they're, they're drowned out or, or silenced by more dominant voices? Um, you know, to, to what extent as a leader, do you showcase your talent to others in the organization? So the key accomplishments, you know, um, that, that uh, women have had on your team, uh, are, are, do others, uh, the more senior leaders, are they aware of, of that? Uh, are you an advocate for them? Uh, are you looking for ways to support the development by aligning them with, with mentors within the company who can guide and support them? I mean, the, the, right there, there's probably 10 things that I talked about that probably every manager could do. Um, and if every manager even did three of those things, uh, we would be really advancing uh, the role of women in, in leadership in our organizations in a dramatic way. Uh, but, you know, I think, the, you know, Kit, the other astute point was we have to understand uh, that it is, it is work we have to do on ourselves. And... Um, uh, and certainly for men, because I, I, I do believe uh, men are a critical part of the solution here. They have to be. Uh, it, otherwise, it, we just won't get there as quickly as we need to. Um, and, you know, and, and I look at, you know, I've got I've got three kids. Um, uh, my two oldest are, are, are boys, my daughter, who is uh, 17. And uh, when she was in grade eight, um, uh, she had to do this speech competition that they that they had in, in, in school. And she took uh, the topic of the role of women at work. And I, I was just really curious to see how she was going to approach the, the topic. And one day she comes to me just frustrated and upset and confused, kind of going, you know, dad, women don't get paid as much as, as men for the same job. I go, yeah, I know that. And, and she kept looking at all of these things. And what struck me was I said, well, did, did you ever think that that would happen? She go, no, why would I? And I thought, actually, that's a good thing. She, she actually thought she'd have an equal say uh, you know, equal pay for her contribution. So that's how she grew up. And that to me is also an important driver of change is, is how, uh, you know, the, the, the next generation coming in, it's coming in with different expectations. I don't think they're going to settle for a leader who's going to marginalize them. 
treat them without respect and dignity. And so I think employees will, will nudge and push and, and, and prod uh, managers, uh, those who are, are not willing to acquire the, the skill sets, the mindsets, and set the tone that um, you know, women, uh, young women, uh, employees and leaders will want. Yeah, very fair point. Expectations certainly are evolving and changing and, and the bar is, is being raised um, of leaders for sure. Um, Kit, I think it, it would be great as a strong female leader yourself, um, it would be great if you could share um, a little bit about what's been helpful to you as a female leader throughout your career. What sort of tactics or strategies have you em- employed for yourself? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, Vince, I'm smiling because your your anecdote is making me think of a story that my mom loves to tell to me, which I'll just tell really quickly. Um, in fourth grade, my fourth grade teacher used to have a tradition of every single week, she would put up one of the names of a, a young girl in class and a young boy. And she would encourage all the other students to write thing, write nice things about them. And when my name was up one week, my mom came in and saw it on the, on the board. And the students had written, it was, it was me and this other student named Andrew. And on Andrew, they had written smart intelligent, you know, insightful. And on mine, they had written pretty, nice, kind. And by the way, at, at, that, at that stage, Andrew and I were both great students. And so the, it really does begin early in terms of how we talk about women and men and boys and girls. And so I think our, our individual work too is also to think about early on, how do we, how do we treat and talk about and build expectations um, around our roles that, that women and men should take up both in, in the workplace and, and in the home. So I just, that, that just evoked that for me. In terms of what has been really helpful for me, a couple of things. One, I've had the privilege of seeing from a young age, extraordinary leadership in, in women. Um, you know, I have, I have some leaders in my family. My aunt is an incredible, um, powerful um, leader who I admired from a young age. And so seeing leadership modeled authority and power taken up by women in my life has been, um, has set the standard for me to say, you know, that I know that I can take that up. And that has been really inspiring to me. And that's continued in the form of seeing manager managers and leaders who are, were just incredible leaders and modeling that for me. And then the second piece is, you know, community. I think that the the communities that I've been a part of, um, whether that's other women who are interested in in growth and learning from each other, um, or uh, with men who are interested in supporting women. Um, Vince, as you said, it's not, you know, it's not just about women getting together, supporting other women, but also about men supporting women. So I think great sponsorship, um, great support, great modeling, and also finding communities that really drive you forward. For me, um, Women in Innovation is a community that I've been deeply involved with for a number of years, and that community has inspired me, challenged me, and and taught me a lot about my own leadership and about um, the leadership of others, so. Great, thank you for sharing that. And and I think as I I reflect on on my career, I, there's really three things I think that have um, been defining moments for me are really helpful, um, you know, for me personally to help me continue to grow as a leader. And the first was sort of taking stock and resetting the expectations of myself um, and what success looks like. Um, and that was most important after I had our second child. So my girls are 17 and 14 now. So that was well over a decade ago. Um, but really that, that, you know, that struggle, I think so many um, of us face with work-life balance. And then you sort of learn that there is no such thing as balance. You know, you, you hope that on the whole, you get it right by focusing your energy where it matters most in a given day or a given week. And so I had to really shift my thinking from time management to energy management and making sure I was saving my energy, my positive energy for the moments that mattered most in a given day or a given week um, and planning for that. So that was a big big aha for me. 
Um, the second one is um, not, you know, it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. Um, they're genuinely people really want for you what you want for yourself and your ability to articulate that and ask for help. A lot of people will really come on board and really help. I'm, I'm fortunate in that, you know, we're in the business of coaching and, and we have an amazing set of coaches. Um, so I have a coach right now um, and there's just different points in my career, um, whether it was taking on a new job or a new role or uh, a new boss is coming into the organization, what have you, there are moments where I think, you know, we could all benefit from a little professional help, you know, so to speak. Um, and then the third one is, is something you both touched on early on in our conversation, which is create safe spaces and, and, and give people grace um, to, to bring their authentic selves, you know, to work. And that has been more important now in a COVID world than ever, ever before. Um, and so really making concerted efforts to do that. And, and a lot of bonding and humor actually comes from that. Um, when, when you see, you know, the more holistic selves, you know, of, of your colleagues coming to work. So in, in an odd sort of way, even though we're really virtual right now, we have really bonded in, in new and meaningful ways, um, I think, as a team. So, so those are just things that, that come to mind um, for me as well. Well, gosh, uh, our time has flown by, um, Kit and Vince. I really appreciate the richness of the conversation and all the great stories and experiences you've shared. Uh, I want to wish everyone uh, a great rest of your day at the conference and uh, uh, all the best. Take care. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you for leading us in this conversation. My pleasure. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Kit.